Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest introduced to you now. Judy Wolf is a certified food addiction counselor and sugar certified and licensed through former podcast guest Bitten Johnson, who we hosted back on episode 477 of our show. Judy has, a, has been in food addiction recovery for 32 years and free from grains, sugars, starches, and alcohol for almost two decades. Judy's passion and commitment to the field of food addiction come both from her professional studies and her personal success in keeping over 125 pounds off her body for more than 17 years. Judy has helped hundreds of individuals in the U.S. and abroad understand not only the nature of food addiction, but also, and more importantly, the way to recover from it. Whether underweight or obese, pregnant or post-weight loss surgery, these individuals have benefited from Judy's practical, no-nonsense, and action-oriented approach. Judy is also active in developing literature to raise awareness of food addiction for healthcare professionals and the general public. As co-founder of Sugar X Global, Judy helped develop a system based on their CARE acronym as the foundation for addicts to grow, recover, and transform. Judy Wolf, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Oh, I'm so excited to be here, Casey. This is going to be a lot of fun. That's so, what I think. So excited to have you. Speaking of boundless, you have boundless amounts of energy. You are so energetic and passionate. I'm so excited to chat with you today. <laughs> Well, I am. Gr- I'm just so happy to be here. What uh, can I say? It's it's, you know? it's a thrill to host you. And I want to start out with something I've been hearing in the nutrition world for a long time. You can just tell me what you think of this statement. Everything in moderation. You should moderate the foods that you eat. What do you think about that? Okay. <laughs> well, of course, or maybe you don't know this, but I don't believe in that at all because. Can I tell you a little of my story, maybe? Absolutely. That's I was cutting to the told. chase just a little bit to to kind of fire you up a little bit, but yes. Well, well, it's just that um, I was told growing up, I, I can, first of all, I can never remember not being overweight, not being on a diet from being a very little girl. I mean, that's the bottom line. And, um, and that's sad. That's sad. And everyone told me, just have a little bit And then, you know, push yourself away from the table and you'll be fine. Well, guess what? They were treating the wrong thing with this person because I can't have just a little bit of certain foods, period. I can't because, you know, I because I couldn't stop. I'm such a person of more. In fact, I often introduce myself as a low bottom, high maintenance food addict and a person of more. Now, some people get upset with labels. I'm not upset with that label for me because it saved my life. And it does save my life every day because I remember who I really am. Yeah, I'm Judy, but that's my modus operandum. I use food just like a drug addict would use a drug or an alcoholic would use alcohol, period. I Would you, Casey, would you offer an alcoholic a sip of booze if you knew that they were an alcoholic? As long as I told them to moderate it, right? They wouldn't have a problem if I just said, (laughs) just have a little bit. What's wrong? Right, right. Well, that's exactly where I come from because obviously you would not offer that to a friend who you knew was, you know, an alcoholic in recovery, period. And that's what it's like for me. It's no different. I have let go of now, and, and you know, I believe this is a primary disease, meaning that I didn't cause it to happen, okay? It's just was sitting waiting to happen. It may have been precipitated by big T trauma or little T trauma or maybe environment. Like if you're raised in a family where they're very nutritious and very oriented that way and never let you have anything, and then you go off to babysit as a teen or you go off to college, you may never stop eating. You know, like you've you've no boundaries there. And then also hormonally at puberty, menopause, these are things that can actually um, precipitate what may have been lying dormant. You know, for me, it was just always there. I always wanted more, but I didn't understand it at all. So anyway, the point is I can't moderate. I absolutely cannot moderate. And I've had to... It, and. Also, not only is it a primary disease, it's chronic, meaning it's never going away. And also it's progressive, meaning I can be in recovery. I can have my food down, 
But I can tell you, I've had to let go of a lot of things over the years. I've been doing this for about 33 years. And I've had to let go of more and more things because it's progressive. Like I used to be able to eat sweeteners, for example. And I would make all sorts of concoctions of things that would replicate anything other people were eating that they could get off a shelf. Um, but I, I'd use other ingredients that didn't trigger me. But six years ago, I gave up sweeteners. I I can't use them anymore. I realized they were starting to make me crave. I call that like methadone. You know, everybody's got to find their own way, um, which is why we don't particularly give out a food plan per se, because we each have different chemical factories in our body. And um, one person needs one thing, one person needs another. But I've personally had to give up sugar, flowers, grains, like rice, potato, you know, I mean, any of those starchy vegetables like corn and peas or whatever, and um, alcohol. And um, I, you know, and, and as I said, I gave up sweeteners also. And, um, and, but for years, they served me, you know, I was okay with them. But as I said, it's a progressive disease. And remember, it's never, ever going away. Yeah. Period. Yeah. You know, so I can tell you, I, you know, I've had to give up a lot of what I call my drug foods or trigger foods. And they're different. And I know people who talk about red light foods, meaning they can't have those. Green light foods, they can have. And then they talk about yellow light foods. I don't believe in those. Not for me. You know, I, if, if they're a yellow light food, you know, um, forget it. It's, it's, it's not on my list personally, because I don't know where it's going to take me. That's okay. Period. That's what I was wondering is your, are your yellow light foods like my yellow light foods? Like I'm, I don't want to go around and tell people that things like fruit are particularly bad for people. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Did fruit make people obese? Uh, probably not. If I have fruit, I then crave my red light foods, and it's way harder to say no to the red lights. It's like that gateway where it's like, why am I playing around with yellow lights if they're just going to lead to the red lights that I know I shouldn't be having to trigger my, you know, anxiety back? You know what I mean? Like, is your yeah. does yours work like mine does in that space? Absolutely. It's like I used to be able to have blueberries. I, I you know, when I start having, I could take and I can. I can quote unquote moderate that and have a few, but it's like, bing, I want more. I want more. So like, why should I do that to myself and rock my peace and serenity? That's the bottom line. It, see, it all comes down to peace and serenity. And for me, the, the biggest gift I've gotten in my abstinence, because abstinence is only like 10% of it, meaning putting down my drug foods. Then I have to learn to live because I'm an addict and I have an addict personality. I didn't learn how to respond appropriately in many areas of my life. Like if you looked at me the wrong way, I'd think he doesn't like me. I mean, it might be you had gas. I mean, really, you never, you, you never know. Okay. So, you know, that's, that's the point is that I have an addict personality Besides, so then I have to work on the 90% of Judy that's left, which involves community and it involves education, you know, because I had to learn what was going on in me. I had to figure out my internal behaviors, what I needed to change in order to have peace in my life. And the biggest thing I gained out of doing all of this, putting down the food, working on myself. And it really started with the food. Like I said, that when you come into anything like this, Casey, I don't know how you feel, but you know, everybody comes to you because they want to lose weight, they want to get muscular, you know, uh, you know, but really it's way more than that. It's your health, it's your whole health and well-being. So by putting down the food, all of a sudden, not chasing my drug, I got to make choices in my life. I get to make choices every single day. Do you want to do this or do you want to do that? You know, and I can, that, that is the biggest gift I've got from all of this. Who would have thought putting down food would change myself and my life that way? It's amazing. You'd never think, 
No, you wouldn't. You and, and you're absolutely right. The people that generally come to us, like you said, they're looking to lose weight. They're looking to add muscle. Those are great things. And I'll tell people like, that's, that's awesome. Like that, that can happen. We can make that happen. But w- what about like the quality of the way your brain works? Or what about your gut health? And, and like, what about playing with your kids and aging? Well, like you, like you're, you're crushing it and to still out and helping people and going to, to workout classes. Like you told me offline, it's, it's, it's so much more than, like you said, than just the weight loss. Um, and I want to take that kind of back to your story. You told me offline that it was almost like as you were going through this and you were parenting, it was almost like your, your, your child was telling you that your behavior was changing when you were eating certain foods. Yeah, I, I, I will share that story. Um, you know, I happen to work with my son. We own a business together and another person, which is incredible. You know, it, it's, it's a gift to me. It's a gift because I never would have thought that, but, um, I started this when I was 38 years old, okay, that my program, my journey about food, you know, I mean, I was on a diet all the time. I can never, ever remember not being on a diet, but I'm talking about my compulsive at that, at that stage, they called it compulsive eating or overeating. Nobody was talking about food addiction, you know, that long ago. Okay. I was 38. I'm 71 now. So I mean, figure it out folks. Okay. I'm not going to. So anyway, um, so my kids were maybe three and a half and seven. My son, you know, when I first started my journey of realizing that I had a problem with food, that dieting wasn't going to help, you know, I mean, it took a long time to figure this out. And, um, he would say to my, he would, when they got a little bit older, when we'd go out to dinner, we didn't go out a lot, but when we did go out to dinner, there was a place that if I wanted to be abstinent, be on my food plan, I could get this dish called fish European. It was a beautiful, fresh haddock with beautiful vegetables on top of it. I could get a salad, you know, I mean, I, that would be my meal, but they were really known for their deep dish pizza. You know, so if I chose to have pizza, I mean, it was like all bets were off. And literally, I didn't even know this till later. My kids would go to my husband and say, can't you make her stop eating? Can't you make her not pick, you know, that? Can't you, you know, and and my husband would say, no, that's up to her. I have no control over her. I mean, you got to give the guy a lot of credit because, I mean, folks, I used to weigh 288 pounds, okay? And I let go of about 130 pounds now. And I mean, that's like a whole person. That's a whole, someone told me in the the, uh, locker room today, that was what she weighed, you know? And she said, so picture, that's what you lost. Even today, you know, because she remembered me when I was quite heavy because wow. she said to you, she's been swimming for like 20 years. And so have I, you know, so so, yes, my kids, I had a change in personality when I ate the wrong food, because I think not only did it biochemically affect my brain, you know, wanting more, um, you know, changing my insight and clarity, you know. But it made me feel like a piece of doo-doo because I knew that I shouldn't be doing that. So then I wasn't happy with Judy. And if you're not happy with yourself, how can you exude happiness and love to everybody else? It's pretty difficult if you're miserable. You make lots of other people around you miserable. You don't mean to, but it happens. Right. Were you aware of that? Like, did they have to tell you that? Or did you know already at some point the food was affecting your mood? Or was it just kind of independent for you? No, I I think I knew. But who wants to admit that when you want your fix? Yeah. I, I'm so, it's a drug to me. It's like, you know, it's like chasing cocaine or alcohol or, I mean, I mean, thank God, I, I, I believe truly if I had gotten into any of that stuff. God only knows what would have happened. And I say that because when I was dating my husband, he slipped some booze, some kind of alcohol into a drink that I had that was not alcoholic. And the minute I took a sip of that drink, I'm not kidding you, I had to run to the bathroom. I had to go pee. 
it's that my body is that sensitive to alcohol. I'm not saying I didn't ever drink. I did, but not not much at all. But I think of, oh my gosh, what I could have gotten into or where I could have gone to if I wasn't using food all the time. Because I don't feel, it's a, see, I believe that addiction is addiction. It's one disease, many outlets. So my outlet is food. You know, and I mean, all, and there are certain types of food, like I said, grains, starches, sugars, alcohol, you know, I don't, I don't touch anything that, that, the those products are in basically. And, um, you know, but somebody else, it could be, you know, it could be just a hardcore drug or it could be alcohol or it could be a process of addiction, like screening. I mean, it's one disease, many outlets. I want to share with you that I believe food is has, is probably the most difficult, okay? It's ubiquitous. It's all over the place. You can't get out of a hardware store without having junk all over the cashier registers, right? I mean, you can't go anywhere that they're not at an end cap, places you would least suspect they would be, yeah. right? Yeah. For sure. Okay. But also not only is it what I consider a substance use disorder, like drugs and alcohol, it's a process addiction. Eating is a process addiction. It's a behavior, you know, and I happen to have the behavior of more. Casey, when I eat a meal, okay, no matter what it is, all right, when I take my last bite, I'm very sad. I always want more. But if I wait, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, there's no, there's no problem. I could go four, six, eight, 10 hours. And I've had to, I don't, I recommend four to six hours between meals, you know, and you try to stop it at a certain time, you know, to, so that you can sleep. Okay. But the point, you know, but if there's an emergency, I've had to go 10 hours without eating and I'm just fine. Even though when I finished my last bite at my last meal, I didn't think I would make it after, you know, I, I wanted more. I'm the saddest person in the world. And I share that with people because I think there's a lot of people out there that feel the way I do, but can't admit that or won't admit that or don't realize it. Because, you know, there's so many people, especially I think women, who I think all their life, they're, they're, they're professionals, highly professional women, you know, and men too. Okay. But highly professional, you know, manage a house, manage kids, work full time. But this is the one thing they can't get is how to put down the food. They, they, they feel their failures, you know, and, 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 you know, they try all the diets out there and they use willpower, which by the way, doesn't last very long at all, you. you know, and, but they feel totally as a failure because, you know, it's overt. It shows on you on most people. Now, now you can be a food addict and be anorexic. I, I need to say that. Body size doesn't say, like, if I look at somebody, I can't say, oh, you're a food addict because you're overweight. That's garbage. That doesn't mean a thing. You know, some people are prone to that and can be metabolically healthy and be fine and not be an addict, you know? Yeah. You know, maybe they have a eating problem, a harmful user. You know, they eat too much of something. And if somebody showed them the way, they'd be okay. Well, you know, they could moderate. That's not, that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who can't stop thinking about food. They don't even realize they have cravings because they're just grazing and eating all day long. Yeah. All day long. And they're they're clueless that there's something going on because, you know, everybody says, push yourself away from the table, have just a little bit of this. And they feel like failures. And that's because they've been treated for the wrong thing. Yeah. Most medical professionals, I mean, don't buy into food addiction. It's coming. It is coming. It's getting more and more. You know that. I mean, the re and the research is going to show that it's a real deal thing. Okay. But it it's going to take more time more time, yep. you know? So, you know, if you're struggling that way, maybe think about, wow, there might be someone out there or someplace, and I'm not talking about just Sugar X Global. There's lots of places you can go. 
but we do deal with real hardcore addiction. I mean, if you're a harmful user, um, you know, in the platform that that I work, um, you're not going to be happy, you know, because if you're a person who can moderate, you are not going to be happy in our space. And you know what? We don't want unhappy people. We don't, we want everybody to be happy. So please, I'm just saying, you know, you'll know right away because you're not going to want to stick around. That's what I'm talking about. That person who, you know, just has tried everything and feels like a total failure and misfit and can't understand. I, I talked to a woman today. I was doing a recovery protection call, which is an hour and a half call we do for people who subscribe to us. You know, they, they've been with us a couple of months because it's, it's priceless. I mean, we do it for free an hour and a half with coach Judy or coach Dave or coach Anna. Okay. And we have a kind of a set format for it because we're trademarking something called recovery protection and it's cues. It's based on cues, customs and consequences. And it's so, um, it's so revealing to people. It's also a form of journaling, even as if you make it very simplistic, but we go into a deep dive with people. And this woman was saying how she, she just was so proficient in everything in her life. I mean, she said exactly what I just said. I couldn't believe it wow. in her words. And she said, you know, but I, I just couldn't figure this out. I couldn't figure this out. She started figuring it out somewhere else in last October, she said. And then she heard one of us, I think, on like the kick sugar or quick sugar or which, you know, we were all over the place. And she said, it just rang a bell to me and she joined us and she can't believe that she's gone this long now, not eating sugar and, you know, the things that trigger her. And she said, it's like, wow, you know, like I can do this. I'm not a failure. It was a beautiful thing to, you know, this was her aha moment that she got. She realized like, wow, I have really changed. And this is a miracle because it's what she longed for all her life. Mm. You know? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's amazing. I've made this point to what you were saying earlier. I made this point to our mutual friend, Tia Reed, and talk about just an, an awful, miserable human being. Tia, if you're out there listening, really try to be happy and a little more optimistic. <laughs> She's like the best <laughs> human ever. Such a sweetheart. We love you, Tia. Um, I think I've also probably made this point in several other episodes, maybe with Bitten. What you said about like, where you find sugar, like me being 40 years old in the Salt Lake Valley, if I wanted to start doing cocaine, it probably wouldn't be that easy for me. Like I'd, I'd have to like ask around and go to some seedy places. It's not like I can just go and get cocaine anywhere. But if you are, if you make the case that sugar is addicted, then we have a massive problem because sugar is everywhere. It is inexpensive. It is socially accepted. The, the, sh the sugar selling stores around my house that sell big old sodas get pumped with extra sugar flavorings and sold with a sugar cookie that's the most popular at the time of day that's like two or three hours after a lunch it's like your afternoon snack time like that's going to be a big problem if it's addictive and we have it at this kind of supply we're kind of hosed that's not going to go very well for most people well casey look around i mean this is what i tell people is look around and I see obese toddlers now, four and five-year-olds who are really obese. And if you look at their parents, in most instances, they too are obese. If you look at what's in their shopping carts, it's cheap. It's cheap to buy macaroni and cheese. I mean, it is cheap to fill your cart with Carb City. It's so, so folks, it's not just sugar, okay? Basically, Basically, anything that comes, I mean, I hate to say this, but anything that comes in a bag or a box that has ingredients more than chicken on it, okay, or legs or whatever, um, is probably, if you're, if you're a food addict waiting to happen, is going to trigger you. And it's so, you know, you've got to look at, and also the sugar that's being put into those items are high fructose corn syrups. I mean, they're, they, they, and I'm not going to get into this because this isn't my bag. Go to Robert Lustig and you can get, you know, Dr. Robert Lustig and he'll talk about it. Go read his books, Metabolical and Fat Chance and all that. But it 
does things in the liver different than regular table sugar that you and you might have on your table, you know, that we grew up with. Okay. It's very different. And the other thing is, this is our toxic triangle that, that we talk about with food is, you know, any sugar, and that includes um, the methadone ones. It includes, you know, any of the, you know, sweeteners that are no calorie, because some of them actually can trigger you more than others. That's right. And then we talk about, um, you know, any of the um, grains, flours, starch, that, that kind of thing. But then we talk about the unhealthy oils, the the soybean oils, the seed oils. You know, you got to be careful if they're, you know, fine if you put them on, but if they're rancid, you got to be really careful. But every single product you buy that has a long label is going to have soybean oil, is going to have high fructose corn syrup, you know. And so that's why I say, and they, I believe, you know, there's something called the bliss point. Have you heard that? I'm sure you've heard of the bliss point. If, if you're, you know, clientele hasn't, it's, you know, the exact amount of sugar, fat, salt, those are the ingredients. And I'm not saying individually any of those are bad because fat is not bad as long as it's the right kind of fat. Salt can be very good and very, it's a very important in my food plan. I have to have it or I'm going to cramp up, you know, the sugar can go. Okay, fine. But the point is, is that they have engineers that, that they that test this stuff to find out the exact and they and they do do studies the exact amount of these ingredients and balance one one another as to where you can't eat just one you've heard that commercial before you can't eat just one so that bliss point is you know look at prego spaghetti products there's a gazillion of them there's a guy that we, we use that in, in our courses or our challenges. We show that he'll go, oh, it's not about addiction. It's about tasting good. You know, I mean, ugh. I want to take them and strangle them, <laughs> I want to strangle them, you know? So, you know, it, you know, the big food is out to get us, you know, and, and quite frankly, I don't eat, I, you know, I'm trying to think, what do I eat with a label? I do have some tomato paste sometimes, but it's just tomato and water or whatever. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, I don't, I don't eat anything that really has a label. You know, I want to understand every ingredient, but folks, it took me a long time to get here. I want to tell you, I wasn't, I wasn't always that way. I used to, I'll tell you, I used to eat soy flour and wheat germ which do didn't trigger me the same way as like regular wheat bread or any, anything like that. I could handle it. But today I don't eat any of that stuff. I don't concoct things. I, and I love my food. I mean, I didn't tell you I'm a foodie. I didn't tell you my son went to culinary school. He, he went to, you know, and got his bachelor's in culinary nutrition and, and then his master's in clinical nutrition because we love to feed people. My mother loved to feed people. He knew his grandmother, which was a lovely thing. So he said, you know, and and in the old country, my parents, my my grandparents, okay, were were cooks and for their shtetls, you know, for their areas. So I come by this honestly, and I can tell you, my husband, my son always says this: shake my family tree. And a bunch of addicts fall out. They're all food addicts. Every one of my aunts and uncles, you know, related, like genetically related to me, were definitely obese, overweight, in inflammation. They were food addicts. I mean, I, I can't, I shouldn't say that because I can't diagnose someone to be that. You diagnose yourself actually with the assessment that I do. But um, they were, they, you know, food. I have four brothers. I had one brother say to me, honest to goodness, I wasn't even talking to him. I was, it was Passover. I was across the table, big, big meal, big, I mean, big deal thing. And um, he was having a conversation with someone and he came out with said, if, if I had to give up carbohydrates, I'd rather be dead. And I think to myself, you will be, <sighs> it makes me sad. I love him. I care about him, but it's the truth. 
It's, you know, and I can't tell anybody what to do. That's the other thing. I can never tell anyone else what to do or have anyone else change. Of course, as an addict, I try to control everyone and everything in my life. That's part of that addictive personality I was talking about. I thought I knew everything, my way or the highway. You know, if I was in a meeting, my answer was the right meeting. It was the right answer. The poor people I supervised in some of my jobs, I, I think back and, you know, I, I've i apologized. You know, I owe them an amend type of thing, you know, because um, I thought I knew everything. And, you know, I know today that if you have three people together talking about the same thing, three people are going to come up with three different ideas. And then you, you know, you come with, between you, which is the best, or you can maybe take a little of this and a little of that, right? But no, I mean, I used to think I knew everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a shame to hear my brother say that broke my heart, but don't talk about what I do. I'm so credible today. And, and by the way, if someone, and I've been in situations where people are like, like on my case about what I do, because personally, I don't tell people to do this. But Casey, I have to weigh and measure my food because I'm such a person and more. Then I know I've had enough and I've not had too much. That's the beauty of why I do it. It's not, people think it's rigid or crazy. It gives me peace of mind. It gives me the boundaries I need so that because I'm always, I always want more. I'm always going to want more. And so I'm happy to have a boundary that says, stop, Judy, you have to stop. And I do like, that's worth it to me. It gives me peace of mind between my ears, you know, for sure. But, um, and, and I got a little off track, but I was just talking about trying to make a point about something. Well, oh well, it's so interesting does it ever like surprise you that people care? Like what, what does anybody oh, care I, if you weigh I know your what food? I was gonna say. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what I want to get back to. You know what my response is for someone like that, Casey, is? What is it about my taking care of myself that upsets you so much? That's a very kind response. I don't say it maliciously, but that's what I say. And it stops people. It's like, it's my issue. It's not yours. Why do you care what I am eating or what I'm what I am doing? And I will tell you, I don't go anywhere without weighing and measuring. In my fanny pack, I have a little scale that I can use. And you know, I mean, I have all kinds of scales, you know, in my house, but that's the one I have in my it's literally, it's like the size of a small paperback book, very thin and even a little smaller. And it's, you know, drug addicts probably use it. It's very accurate, <laughs> but the, the to weigh things out. Okay. But the point is, is that I have that with me. So I can go out to eat anywhere, anytime, you know, because I have a scale with me, because if I didn't have my scale, I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat. I'd say, sure, I'll go out to dinner with you, but I'll have a cup of coffee or tea. You know, you go ahead and, and enjoy and that does not bother me at all. I can wait, you know, or if I'm going somewhere, sometimes I might eat before. It it really depends. But the point is, is I literally, this is a true story. I went to unexpectedly to a Chinese restaurant with a bunch of people after a performance. And there were probably 10 people. Okay. We were at a long, thin table type of thing, seeing each other. And, you know, people ordered, it was Chinese, people ordered, you know, what they ordered. So I ordered something that I knew I could have, that I could pick out my meat, weigh my vegetables separate. I asked for a separate plate, you know, and I was across from a couple, very talkative people. And um, I, you know, I weighed and measured my food. That's what I did. I saw the woman at an event and she said to me, oh, you're not eating. And I said, no, because I don't, I, I think it was at synagogue. I didn't have my scale with me at that moment. And I said, no, I, I weigh and measure my food no matter where I'm at, you know, and I don't have my scale with me. And she said, no, you don't. And I said, what? I said, I said, excuse me, could you explain? She goes, well, 
we were sitting across from you at the Chinese restaurant and you didn't weigh and measure your food. Casey, I weighed and measured my food. See, people don't care. <laughs> people don't care. I'm just saying, that's what I'm saying. So no matter where I go, I take care of myself because everybody is more interested in themselves than me. But as an addict, I used to think, you know, like everybody was looking at me, judging me, you know, making assumptions, you know, and I know today that I'm but a grain of sand in the beach. Like, who cares what you do? Right? So, I mean, that's a true story. That's crazy. True story. That's crazy. I am not triggered by you weighing your food. It actually didn't change anything in my life by you telling me that story. That's crazy. I Yeah, I get, like, I understand why people do it because they are triggered by that kind of thing. And anytime somebody's taking a positive step in their life and cutting things out, it's going to make them feel a certain way. But, like, yeah, I don't know. It just, to me, this all comes back to kind of the difference between fault and responsibility. Like, it is not your fault that you are addicted to this stuff. Your parents gave it to you. It was cheap then as well. It, it's not your fault that you didn't hear any different. It's not your fault that, like you said, the food industry is making a lot of money on a lot of people and is screwing all of us out of our health. It's not your fault. But it is now your responsibility. Once you learn this, now you have to do something about it, or you're going to pay some really uncomfortable um, prices at the end of this. And so tell us how, going back to your own personal story, whether or not you recommend people do this or not, tell us what were some of those progressive steps you took? What were some of the first things? What were the hurdles? What was the most challenging, like just, just your own anecdote? Yeah. Well, first of all, I had an aha moment. I was on, like I told you, I was always on a diet. I was on a 500 calorie liquid diet oh and um, I had to go get weighed twice a week, blood work and weighed in by a nurse. And the nurse said to me, you know, I'll never forget this. She said to me, you know, Judy, you know, have you ever thought about that? Maybe you have, you know, maybe you're a compulsive overeater. You know, like this isn't about being good or bad. This isn't a moral issue. This is about like you have a problem. Have you ever thought about that? I'd never heard that before, Casey. Okay, ever. And that was that was when I was about 38 years old. Wow. Okay. Cause it's when I started my journey in food recovery to understand that I, I couldn't diet anymore. So um that it was amazing, you know, and um and also, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize what I know today. Of course, 500 calories, you're starving yourself. Metabolically, you're not even going to lose weight eventually because you just, your body's going to like, like a beer, going to hibernate, right. you know, and shut down, you know? And, um, but anyway, I never got to that far. So that's what led me to, you know, think about this. And so, you know, from that woman, from that nurse, and she probably could have lost her job for saying that to me because right. this was a medically run at a hospital program and she was working for them. Anyway, um, I started my journey because I couldn't, I remembered what she said. I didn't start like right away, but um, under the, pre, now mind you, I'm on this liquid 500 calories under the pretense of getting my children hats and gloves because it was winter time. It was early December. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. I decided that I would take them to a store and um, to get that. It was a Friday, bought bags and boxes of things and then stopped at Friendly's. I don't know if you knew Friendly's as an ice cream parlor. Okay. okay. All right. And um, bought a half gallon of something. I mean, this is my 500 calorie diet and proceeded to eat it during the weekend. And I thought, oh my God, this is something, something is wrong with you. So I actually got on a hotline with the program, this other person that the nurse had mentioned to me. And I, it, it was Greek. What they were saying to me was absolutely Greek, but Monday morning they had a meeting and it was a time I could go. And I went, that was when I started my journey. It was early December. And, um, and I, I lost a lot of weight. I did a food plan that they gave out more or less, more or less. And um, I lost over a hundred pounds wow. and uh, kept it off for a couple of years. And sitting in my living room, 
one day, I thought I could have literally one cheese curl. Okay, because I'm known as the 80 pound cheese curl. I took that cheese curl <clears throat> and I could not stop eating. Okay, it, it, I didn't gain it all at once, but I lost my abstinence, my ability to stay on my food plan. And it took me literally 13 years of misery to figure out what I had to do and to get the food down, all right? And I gained 80 pounds, 80 of that 100, over 100 pounds I lost. I mean, so if there's anyone out there that can relate to this, there's hope for everybody, because I'm telling you, there's hope, because, you know, I, I'm an example of that one cheese curl that changed my life, devastated me, brought me down to, you know, more depression, anxiety, you know, all of that. But I never stopped trying. I knew that there was no other answer but to give up the things that stood in my way, that triggered me, that lit up my brain. Of course, I didn't know about that stuff then. I know that today from studying. But my dopamine got hit. My reward center in my brain got hit. It's a very old center in your brain. It has a, you know, it's there it's very important. It's your motivating center. It keeps us alive. It gives us the drive to go get food, to go and hunt, to go and get the right kind of sleep, to go and have children. I mean, it's very important, but mine is mine has been hijacked and haywired. No question about it. So anyway, I finally found my solution, which was something, and this is the other thing, folks, to think about. I knew in my heart of hearts where I needed to go. I knew after I picked up that cheese, cheese curl, I wasn't willing to do it for 13 years. But I knew I had to go somewhere to a particular place, a particular program where I would have to weigh and measure and give up all grains and starches except the wheat germ and the soy flour, okay? Okay. I did not want to weigh and measure without exception. That really bothered me. Of course, today, I actually know someone whose son had dinner with President Obama, okay? And she was invited, all right, in the same program I did, and she weighed and measured her food, okay? <laughs> like, I'm, that's what I would do. I would weigh and measure my food, yeah. you know, or... or I would request it before or, or I'd eat before. Or, like I said, I, I leave nothing to chance. I will take care of myself no matter what. That's another thing. No matter what is a very strong message that I share with everybody about my food. Because no matter what, I'm not going to pick up. I have suffered 13 years, you know, of that misery. Knowing what I knew, you know, that I knew the serenity I could have with having the food down and the weight loss I could have, but I couldn't get it back. I couldn't get it back. So, you know, I mean, that's like my journey. I mean, that's why I tell people, you know, if you are struggling and you know what you need to do, it's okay. You'll find a place. You're going to find the right place to be, to take care of yourself. And that, you know, I'm literally powerless over my first bite of certain foods, just like an alcoholic is powerless over taking that sip of booze. Okay. It's no different for me, but I'm not helpless. I'm definitely not helpless because I know what I need to do, but I have to be willing to do it. You know, it all, I, I have to be willing to sit on my hands sometimes, you know, and not eat no matter what. The minute Judy has a food thought and it happens because you know what? There could be a crunch that somebody does could trigger me. It could be a smell, you know, an aroma. It could be the sight of something. I mean, you go buy, buy all these pastry things in a grocery store, whatever, you know, I mean, I'm human, you know, I'm human and I'm a food addict. All right. And, you know, but I don't have to partake. I don't have to use a drug addict is going to want to use, but they don't have to, yeah. 
you know, and I can tell you that today. So, you know, I tell people the minute you have a thought, run the other way, literally, whether you have to go outside and go for a walk, make a phone call to someone. I try to tell people have a safe place in your home. Maybe your bedroom is a safe place. Make sure to take your cell phone with you. Go to your bedroom where there's a no food zone. Okay. And, you know, make a phone call to somebody or have some reading in there that's going to help you or a journal. You know, there's all sorts of way we can connect that, that hijacked, those hijacked pathways to the frontal cortex. See, we call the, the reward center, the addicted part of our brain, we call that red dog, like Bitten does, because Bitten's my mentor. You know, I met her six years ago when I was taking a, a different course in becoming a food addiction professional. And I asked her, I, I was so impressed with her. I asked her, would you mentor and supervise me? Because I needed a supervisor. And she said, I'd love to. Thank you, God, you know, for Bitten Johnson. She's an incredible, incredible lady. Okay. And then I was in her first um, holistic medicine for addiction course in English that she had that's where I met Anna my other partner all right and um and actually now um Dave Anna and I teach in her course we teach in her course and um I mean you know I it, it, she's she's one of the greatest gifts in my life and she to me is the guru of food and sugar addiction and um so anyway we talk about red dog blue dog and so you know what we want to do is somehow connect the blue dog to this red dog area, that deep seated instinctual area, because this is where your willpower is, your reasoning is, you know, it's where you can solve problems. I mean, it, it makes all the difference in the world. But but when you are in trouble, when you have that first thought, you got to do things really fast, like think no matter what, because that doesn't take much brain power, because otherwise red's going to take over, you know, or, you know, um, Easy does it. You know, I mean, these are slogans that you see, you know, being used in recovery programs, you know, just for today. I mean, you've got to do something really quick and get yourself out of the situation because otherwise, you know what? If you wait much longer, you're going to eat. Yep. You're going to you're going to pick up your drug, period, yep. because it's just too tempting. It's too tempting. So you have to have like if you're going to a party and you don't know what's going to be served or or. or or maybe you even do, okay? I tell people, you know what? Drive yourself or have an exit route. Don't take, leave anything to chance. That's where I talk about plan, prepare, and protect, the three Ps. you got to take care of yourself. No one's going to take care of you like you can take care of you. And also, the people, I call the people out there, you know, like normal people with food, earth people. They don't get it. They'll never get it. They'll never understand me as an addict, period. I get it. I accept, see, I can accept that today. Acceptance is a superpower, you know? So I can accept that today and I can surrender personally to that. I can surrender to the foods I can't eat because you know what? I'd much rather the life I have today. I mean, I went back to school. I, I have to tell you, at six, literally my birthday, I had my 65th birthday in Iceland six years ago, okay? And it was, um, I think the day before we graduated from the, the first class in food addiction that was ever authored, okay? Came out of Iceland. And, um, you know, and I, you know, I was 65 and went back to school. And the only reason I could do that was because I was abstinent and free of my drug and had clarity of mind to know what I wanted to do. And I was scared to death to go back to school at that age. My son did it with me, which was great. Oh, I have cool. to tell you, we went over and another friend went over together. And, um, you know, what a gift. What a gift. And it's all because who would have ever thought putting down food could change someone's life so much? That's amazing. You know, yeah, that's, that's what I tell people. I said, who would have thunk? Who would have thunk that could make such a difference in your life? You know, and I see that, I see those miracles happening all around me. And I tell people, don't keep coming back. Like, like they disappear from our meetings or they disappear from our platform or whatever, but they have a year subscription. I tell people, 
even if you're in the food, don't keep coming back. Just stick around. You never know when the miracle is going to happen. You never know when someone's going to say something to you that's going to change your life. Really? Isn't that the truth? I'm sure you can relate to that. Absolutely. Oh, I love that. That's amazing. Okay, so before we go any further, can I put you on the spot and see if you'd like to come back to talk a little bit more in depth about your work with with um, Global Global X Sugar and and all of the ways that you help people? I, I think if we talk about it now, we're not going to have time to really, really do it justice. So would you be willing to come back for a second episode? Oh, yeah. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Is that time up? I mean, it's been that long. No, huh? we're good. I just oh, I, I wanted to ask you one other question because I think timing wise, this is actually perfect. We are catching you at a time where you are just starting to maybe do some resistance training, which I'm very curious about. <laughs> I think it would be way fun again to just kind of see what your thoughts are now. And then when we come back, we can check up on you and see how things are going, whether you like it or not. You, you can, but I can tell you, I'm probably not going to be too far along only because I'm determined to read. And I have about three books going on and I, and I'm busy with work. I mean, I work full time yeah. and, and, and also, Casey, to be honest with you, you, you got to have a why to do all of this stuff, okay? And you got to dig deep, and we do that with people. But one of my biggest whys was I wanted to be around to um, have grandchildren. I wanted to be around to see my children grow up, you know? And um, And I have three lovely granddaughters today, and I am able not only to be with them, but to get on the floor with them and to play with them. And when I visit with them, because I watch these kids um, one day a week, um, I don't, I don't use screens. I won't use screens. Good for okay. You. And, um, you know, and, um, and the other grandmothers are the other rest of the time, and, but she works at the same time she's with them and she will use screens and that's absolutely fine. But I'm not going to do that. I get on the floor and I play with them or I'm at the table or the counter, you know, doing word books or whatever. They're, you know, almost one is almost five, one is three, you know, that I watch. And it's a handful. Let me tell you, it's a handful. <laughs> so, you know, so when I have spare time, it's it's like trying to take and 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 unfortunately, my husband's been diagnosed recently with a medical problem. That is requiring time. So I just want to tell you, I can't guarantee that I'm going to, you know, it's, it's pushing me, but I can't guarantee that I'm going to be far along in that area, but it's, it's, it's in my radar screen for sure. Good for you. you know? And and again, knowing what your why is, it's the same why as a lot of people, as we get older it, it, in the beginning, our why might be, we want to look a certain way after a little while, we might want to feel a certain way. And then after a while, it's like, no, I actually want to age. I want to age well. And strength training is right. so good for that. And people like yourself. I know so busy, lots of time. You want to do other things. You've got a book that says you can strength train in about 15 minutes. What do you think about that? Right. Well, I, I think it's great, but I hate it. You have to, and I didn't, I didn't tell you this and you didn't say this, but in my past life, I was a physical therapist. That's what my degree is in. Okay. And I hate to tell you folks, I would tell my patients and I mean, I was obese then and, you know, not in great shape. At that exercise sucks, excuse me, but it was not my favorite thing to do. And I do know that strength training is, is something I should be doing. I mean, you didn't tell people that I get up at five in the morning and I do my stretches and I do my back exercises and I do my knee exercises. So I'm doing, I am doing some strength training and stretching and I do that faithfully every morning, you know, before, just before that I pray and I meditate because that helps me focus for the day. And then I go out oftentimes by quarter to eight and, um, I do, you know, deep water aerobics in, in the pool. So it's not like I do nothing. And I did tell Casey that I, um, get 10,000 steps a day, almost without fail. It's very rare. And part of those 10,000 steps is my sometimes running around my house for 20 minutes without stopping. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a a slow, but I mean, I, I do over a mile doing it slowly like that just to get my zone points. Okay. Like today between, but I couldn't believe the workout in the pool today was unbelievable. I started with 1200 steps 
at the end of the 45 minutes, I had 6,500 steps. Wow. It was a, it was quite a workout in the pool. <laughs> Sounds like you know? it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was amazing. I mean, I, we have the most wonderful person. She is just a master, a master at, at, in the pool, a master. Anyway, I'm very, very fortunate. You know, but anyway, I just I just want people to know that I I do exercise. It's part of my well being. You know, because otherwise, I what I tell people is I'd be a thousand pounds or dead. Right, Casey, I, I really would be a thousand pounds or dead. Wow. You know, so wow. You know, well, so, but well, I'd be happy to come back and 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 um, talk with you. I absolutely just so thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. I think the listener will take so many practical tips from your story. And the next time we talk, we can go a little bit more in depth about the systems and different things you put in place to help people be successful. Um, I, I have to tell you as you're starting, obviously you're very fit and you've been doing workouts. I'm, I'm going to tell you that resistance training, it sucks. <laughs> it really, I know. I, well, that's what I'm saying. I know that. See, that's the problem is I know too much. I am dreading it. I, I'm don't being honest. You. I don't blame I'm you. I'm being honest. Yeah, that's know, totally I have, fair. I an, I'm a, you know, because I can't stand doing, I do squat, you know, I have a ball, a big ball, and I do a squat on the wall, and I do a particular prayer with that to get me through it at all, you know, and I can't wait till it's over, yep. you know. And I do one, and one other exercise I'll tell you I do, but you, you need to understand, when I started out, literally um my physiatrist asked me to be on all fours on on the mat okay and lift an arm up and i would fall over i would fall over this was pre covid okay i would fall over and um he, and he says oh you can do it and i'm thinking as a pt i, I got to start way back you know b- before i try that even okay so literally i started on my stomach lifting my, doing a straight leg raise back, you know, extension. Okay. From my, from my butt, from my glutes. Okay. So I, I couldn't get my toe off the floor and he wanted me to be on all fours and lift my arm. Obviously that was a problem. So I started working, like I said, doing that. And now I can do 15 reps of that and lift as far as my back will allow me to lift. Okay. Now, now, Believe it or not, I can get on all fours and extend one arm and one leg, you know, opposite arm, opposite leg, and bring them together 15 reps. Nice. Okay. So you, I mean, I'm telling you, I work, you can imagine how hard I work doing it my way. That one other exercise that I absolutely hate, which is where, where I just know, I just know resistance, I know, is to do a bridge, okay? And I wanted to be able to lift my leg up. I'm talking about, you know, a, a, you know, both feet on the floor being a bridge, okay? And I, the thought of even moving a leg away was traumatic, okay? And if I tried, if I tried, I got such a bad cramp in the leg that was holding me up, okay? All right. But today, today... I can do that, you know, do a bridge and for one minute, hold a leg up nice. without, without, you know, I mean, with one, sometimes I have one hand on the floor, but some, it depends which side I have a weaker side. Otherwise my hands aren't even on the floor. Now, is that not a miracle? That's I mean, you amazing. Can Good for you. You know, uh... so I, I mean, but see, I know how much I hate that one minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long minute. <laughs> Uh, that's wonderful. You're such a great example of of taking control of your life, realizing that things are hard and they do suck and it's not that easy, but you're doing it. And it's like you said, you wouldn't trade anything for the benefit of how your life is and to be able to play with your grandkids and share your message at age 71 is absolutely just amazing. This has been an awesome conversation. I'm so excited to chat again. We'll get an update on the strength training and see how that's going. But before then, where would you like people go to find you and connect with you and your work? Okay, so go to sugarxglobal.com. Okay, that's our website. It's a lousy website because we're in the middle of processing a new one, okay? And I and I do want to tell you that if you scroll down on that, it's really important to know this. There's, um, it's not on the top, but scroll down 
and find three simple steps to crushing your cravings. It's free, okay? So you can get, a, you know, a taste. And also there's a place where you can book a 15 minute free call with Daviana or myself, okay? Totally free, you know? And um, if you want something that shows you more of our, um, we do a lot of worksheets and I don't like the word work, but, 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 you know, I mean, you, you got to do work folks, you know, like, like we're talking Casey, right? You got to do work. It just doesn't happen. All right. There's um, a book you can buy an email, you know, you can download for seven bucks to give you a flavor of the, th I mean, we proliferate, we have tons of stuff that we do to help people. It is amazing. If you want to reach me personally, go to hello at sugarxglobal.com. That's our email for Anna, Dave, and myself, and put attention, Judy, you know? So you know, if you want to reach me, you can do it that way. Um, I, I don't know. I think, I think that, I mean, we're on, we have an Instagram, we have a sugarxglobal.com YouTube. You know, you can get a flavor of us. I mean, you're getting a flavor of me already with this. Um, you know, you can meet Dave and Anna there. Um, you know, Dave's 36. Anna is in her late 50s. You know, so we kind of span. It's kind of cool. We kind of span and we have people of all ages, you know, whatever. I'm the person in the ditch. I mean, I, I'm, I, I say that because I've been doing this for so long now. I mean, 33 years is a long time. I've been clean 18 plus years, you know, from my drugs. So, you know, I'm the, you know, I'm a hardcore food addict, you know, food addict, you know. I mean, Anna and Dave are too. They'll tell you they're sugar addicts or whatever. But I mean, I've been doing this like the longest. So I'm, I'm the practical person, you know. And if you're anywhere near my age, 50 to 70, you know, like, you know, let me tell you, like we, we got lots of folks. We got lots of folks because um, there is a solution to this problem, That's and awesome. it is not moderation and it's not pushing yourself away from the table. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love that message. That message needs to get out to more people. Thank you so very much for everything you've gone through and for being willing to again share that message with people out there. Um, definitely send everybody to your website to be able to take advantage of those resources and book a call. But for now, I'm looking forward to chatting with you again, maybe a month or two down the road. We'll see how things are going and um, we can continue this chat. But for now, thank you so very much, Judy, for everything that you do. And thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. And thank you for having me. It was such an honor. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. Thank you so very much for continuing to listen to Boundless Body Radio. As 2023 has come to a close and we're starting another new year in 2024, I always try to reflect on not only the direction that we want to go in the future, but also how much we have grown in this last year. Our podcast has now generated well over 400,000 downloads from all over the world, and it's all thanks to fantastic listeners like yourself. I hope you are as excited for the new year as we are around here. The lineup of guests that we have coming up is absolutely staggering, and we're always striving to bring you the best content from the most amazing people in health, nutrition, and wellness. Remember that you can always head on over to our website to book a complimentary 30-minute session with us at myboundlessbody.com. On our homepage, there is a book now button where you can select a time to speak with us about your health and fitness plan, especially for the new year. We've absolutely loved chatting with so many of you out there to bounce ideas off each other and try to come up with plans to help you achieve specific goals. And seriously, I really do mean this. Even if it's just to say hello and introduce yourself, we absolutely love connecting with our listeners in the community. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel as well if you want to watch these full interviews and also shorter interviews on more specific topics that are taken from these interviews. We've gotten really great feedback over there, and it's also a really fun way to interact with people who comment. We read and reply to every single YouTube comment we get, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and leave as many comments as you like to keep the conversation going. 
And of course, if you haven't already, please leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcast. It really is the best way to make sure that the podcast gets out to more listeners. Your five-star ratings and reviews are the best way to support us here at Boundless Body and to support the podcast at Boundless Body Radio really only takes a moment and it's very meaningful to us. Cheers to 2024 and thank you again for listening to Boundless Body Radio.